My name is Mark Ottenweller. This is my wife, Lynn. And we're here today because we believe that we can change the world. You know, the world's a terrible place. And a lot of bad things have happened, even recently in the world. In the Ukraine, there's war and violence and hatred and anger. In West Africa, Ebola. We'll talk more about that later. Loss, pain, heartache can affect hundreds of thousands of people. Syria and Iraq, ISIS, terror, rape, beheading. Even in the United States, loneliness, emotional issues, challenges, suicide. Brothers and sisters, it's undeniable that the world needs changing. Amen? Dr. Sanjay Gupta of CNN did a recent report on loneliness in America. They describe it as an, an epidemic quietly sweeping our society. How many of you have been infested at one time or another with loneliness? Yeah. yeah. You know what that feels like? <clears throat> the gray cloud coming in. 60 million Americans struggle with loneliness. One out of every five people in America. Right. It increases your mor mortality rate to 45%. Loneliness is an epidemic. I think when we look at all these things, I know for myself, there's two responses. There's that really crazy side of me that goes, we're going to change this. And then there's a second side that goes, are you crazy? This is so much bigger than we are. That's right. We can't do it. And the fear and all the thoughts of hopelessness come in. You know, Albert Einstein said, the world is a dangerous place to live in, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. That's right. Wow, that's, that's right. crazy. Because there's less of them than us. So why do they win? We are called to change the world. We know the people that have decided, you know, change comes when someone gets so indignant about something that they're fed up and they're not going to allow it to prevail. Right. We have great examples of that. The vision of Martin Luther King that said that we will not tolerate this racial inequality in our country. Right. And I'm going to personally give my life to seeing something done about it. Right. We are here today worshiping the way we are so freely because someone fought for rights. And it does affect our lives. Someone gave up their life for our rights. That's right. Yeah. Mandela. Wow, I love Mandela. That was my dream <laughs> was to meet Nelson Mandela. Um, a man of determination. 27 years in prison and not losing the dream of changing the world. That's right. How do you do that? How do you not just give up and roll over? He was a man of deep determination, determined to do something. Gandhi. We're going to change the world. It's going to take sacrifice. Don't kid yourself. It's not going to roll over and play dead. We're going to have to sacrifice to pay the price that it's going to take to change the world. But it's worth it. Amen. It's worth it. You know, we know that the person that's impacted this world the most is Jesus Christ. And Jesus gave us a, a road map. He gave us a plan. And when he went out, the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. He saw the crowds. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He got his guys together. He said, the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Let's pray to the Lord of the harvest. And God brought you all here. Amen? You see, Jesus every day was involved in teaching and preaching and helping and healing. That's what he did. Take all of the verses out of the Bible that he said in the New Testament, you'll see what he did. That's what he did every day. We've got to go back to Jesus and back to what he did. And not just talk about what he said, but actually do what he did. All of us can be involved in teaching and preaching, amen? Talking to people about the Word of God, sharing the Word of God with them, casual places, Bible talks, studies, getting together with people. We can all be involved in helping people every day in some way. 
socially, emotionally, physically, spiritually. The word healing is used 20 times in the Gospel of Matthew. That's what Jesus did. And in Matthew 8, he quotes Isaiah 53, by his wounds we are healed. But that's what Jesus did. We can all be involved in that. All of us can be involved in helping people and healing people every day. And that's what Jesus did. And so in Matthew 9, Jesus did it. In Matthew 10, he called his disciples and sent them out. And in Matthew 11, it says, you go tell John what you've seen and heard because people can already start seeing it happen. And that's what we need to see among singles all over the world. Amen? Amen. Teaching and preaching, helping and healing, we all need to do that every day. Somehow, in some way, you can help someone every day. And that's how we're going to change the world. You know, I grew up in a third world country. Uh, when I was a little girl, I was a prisoner of war, and I watched people being killed. And I knew one thing at the age of nine is that the world's not the way it's supposed to be. As I got older, I really, my heroes were revolutionists, okay? I did not want a white picket fence. I wanted to change something in this world. And I thought, I don't care who's not or who, someone's got to do something. And I couldn't find anyone else stepping up to the path. And I remember thinking, I want to make a difference. And I honestly would study those guys. All right, why? What makes them move? What? But you know, when I met Jesus, I met the ultimate revolutionist. That's right. I cannot describe to you. I grew up around him, you know? I grew up around Jesus like some of you did. But when I met him, when he was no longer a story in a book, That's right. but he was a man in my life, yeah. I was stunned. How can someone be so strong and so gentle? Right. How can someone look at authority and say, you have no power that hasn't been given to you from above? And stop when a widow's going through a crowd with her only son dead and never be too busy for that. He started a revolution with one cursing at a time. I looked at the story in John 4, the woman at the well. Oh, my goodness. I would have been over at McDonald's with the disciples looking for lunch, okay? Right. They're all out there. They're hungry. And he stayed by the well, and he saw what I would have missed. He saw a woman like a lot of the women we study with. Been in one relationship too many. Burned. No self-esteem. I'm not getting married again because it didn't work the last four times. The emptiness. Knowing that everyone in your community judges you for the life you're living. Hopeless and helpless. And in one day, she went from the talk of the town to the hope of the town because one revolutionist decided to get involved. That's right. I want to be like him. Amen. And I don't want to lose that desire to be like him. We cannot. When we said Jesus is Lord, we said we'd be like him. That's right. We've got to rekindle, that's revive right. that revolution in our hearts that says whatever the cost, that's what I committed to. That's what I'm doing. Amen. Let's revive the revolution. You know, this is from the Ivory Coast. That's my family. And a cool night in October 2007, we came home from dinner. My wife and I and uh, my daughter and one of her friends came back to our apartment. Right at the door to the apartment, my wife collapsed. She died that night. She was a credible woman. Some of you know her. Incredible woman of God, of deep conviction, of passion, of love for other people. But you know what I did? I began to get out old photo albums and old videos and things we've done and pictures of places we've been and people we've worked with. And I began to think about all the things that we did and all the people we studied the Bible with and all the people we counseled. And I thank God that we lived deliberately, that we didn't mess around, that we didn't waste time, that we studied the Bible with people and counseled people and helped people. Diane started a whole program for women of worth, helping women that have been raped and abused. We helped with the leaders and raising up women and leaders around Africa. Eighty-four churches were planted in Africa. We helped hundreds of people become disciples, living deliberately every day. She worked a lot with the HOPE programs. Today we've helped 172,000 orphans in Africa because we live deliberately every day. None of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. All we have is today. 
but we can live deliberately today and every day. Let's make every day count. I thank God for everything Diane did for our lives and what we're doing and what Lynn and I are doing now because we can live deliberately every day. Go ahead. On February 4th of 1986, I was a 28-year-old, and I was at NYU Medical Center waiting for the end of my husband's surgery. Barry had had a seizure, and they were taking him in for surgery, and I had been told by the doctor that it was a minor surgery and everything would be fine. I was so casual, I fell asleep in the waiting room. But I'll never forget the look of Dr. Joseph Ransahoff's face when he came out of that room, and I knew it wasn't as simple as he said it was. They had found a brain tumor. He had an astrocytoma, a glioblastoma. And I was told that Barry had one to five years to live. I was 29 years old. All I wanted in life was to change the world, and now my world was crumbling in front of me. You know, it's funny. I don't know how many of you women can relate to this. My gut response was, okay, let's move next to NYU Medical Center, and let's play it safe. You know, sometimes safe is the most dangerous place to be. That's right. That's right. There's no safety in playing it safe. Mm. Barry was totally the opposite, which honestly, I didn't always respond in the most righteous way, okay? <laughs> Barry was like, well, I'm dying. The world is still lost. And what that means is I have less time to do something about it. That's right. I better get busy. That's right. What would you do if you found out you had a year to live? I'd probably be thinking of all the places I haven't visited yet, as if that would really make a difference, you know? Yeah, but I got to see Greece. Why? Are you going to talk about Greece and heaven? Oh, come on. You know, I, I want to try this food. I, I can imagine where my mind would go. Barry had this simple, clear minded decision to act decisively. It's almost as if he wanted to do it before he talked himself out of it. You know, sometimes we need to act before we talk ourselves out of it, before fear comes in like a cloud, and we think we could do it, and now we don't anymore. Right. And you know what's interesting? We had a day of prayer and fasting and prayed that God would give him 15 years, and he did. And what people don't realize is that all three of our children were born after he was given a year to live. That's right. On a Monday night, we got a phone call from Steve Johnson. I had a nine-month-old, and he said, what are you doing tomorrow? And Barry said, why? Do you want to go to a movie? He said, no, I need you to go start a church in Haiti. <laughs> I'm a nurse. I'm like, what kind of dumb person sends someone with a brain tumor to a place with malaria, yellow fever, and with a nine-month-old baby? What's that about? <laughs> Barry said, I'm dying anyway. This will be awesome. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And we went to Haiti and started two churches in Haiti. Later went to the Bahamas and started church. Led the church in Puerto Rico, started a church in St. Thomas, led all over the United States. That's right. Because one man, not me, because I followed, <laughs> decided to act <laughs> decisively and not let fear determine his life. We will never change the world if we don't learn to act decisively. Amen. Honestly, that's right. Honestly, I thank God that we can live deliberately, that we can act decisively, also that we can stay determined. I know some of you have been around a while, so have we. I know some of you have been through challenges, so have we. I know some of you have been through changes in the church and leadership and different things, so have we. Personal challenges, emotional challenges. You know, when Diane passed away, I didn't think I'd survive. I never thought I'd make it. I thought I'd just go off the deep end somewhere, just go out and get drunk. I don't know. Self-pity. Self-pity was knocking at my door every day, trying to drag me down. I'd go to church and I'd cry every church service for two or three months. I'm just telling you it was a tough time. But brothers and sisters, we need to stay determined. We can't give up. We need to be full of the grace of God. I fall down on my knees and thank God every day for saving me. God is saving you today. I hope you thank God today for saving you. He's saving us every day. We're filled with an expressible and glorious joy. 
receiving the goal of our, of our faith, the salvation of our souls every single day. Let's thank God for saving us every day. Amen? Yeah. Let's pray, God, pour out your spirit on me every day. I need help every day to teach and preach and help and heal just like Jesus did. And we can all stay determined and stay the path and live deliberately and act decisively. Every day, that becomes a really real phrase when you're shattered. Sometimes it's every hour, sometimes it's every moment. When Barry died, I felt like shattered glass. You know when glass shatters and you just pick up the pieces and you don't even know what it was before it started. Some of you might relate to that where you feel like, where did I go? I was here and then I'm gone. And I don't know if I could ever find my way back. You know, what I've learned as time has gone on is that there's some really bad chapters in your book of life. That's right. And they're really bad. And you know when you're reading a book and you're in a bad chapter, you're just like in it. You're like, oh my goodness, this is horrible. And you just can't. But it's just a chapter. And if you stopped reading there, it'd be a really bad book. Uh-oh. If you stay in that chapter and don't keep living, it's going to be a bad book. But it's only a chapter. And those are the chapters that have taught me the most. That's where I saw God, where Job said, I had heard about you, but now I've seen you. I saw God not in the great started church and all those great. I saw God on a bathroom floor with my eyes swollen from crying and a Bible open, trying to figure out how to do show and tell for a five-year-old who had just lost her dad. That's right. And if you're a single mom, I know your world. I was a single mom 11 years. If you're world has been shattered and you're trying to redo it. I know what that feels like. But God said that he blessed Job with the second half of his life more than the first. And I claim that promise and I claim it for you. That you will be determined to stay the course so that God can give you a glorious ending to your book. Amen. Woo. You know, since my wife passed away, I've worked in Haiti a lot. I worked in the Ivory Coast after the Civil War a lot. I've worked with orphans a lot. One of the most exciting things that I place I'm working today is my neighborhood. We had some big parties last year, invited all our neighbors. I knocked on all their doors. So I just moved in. I just got married to Lynn. Told them all about Lynn, our story. They all, <laughs> they all knocked on the door about two weeks later. I want to meet Lynn. Lynn, where's Lynn? <laughs> It was awesome. Since that time, we've had a walkathon about a week ago. You'll see some crazy pictures on Facebook. I know about 50 of my neighbors by name. And that's my challenge to you. Stay determined. Let's love our neighbors as ourselves. The word neighbors used 140 times in the Bible. Many of us don't even know our neighbors. Let's get to know our neighbors. Let's love our neighbors. Let's help them. Let's meet their needs. Let's, just stay, let's stay determined that no matter what else is ha happens, we're going to do what God wants. Teach and preach and help and heal and love our neighbors. How do we change the world? One person at a time. You know, it's funny. The story has been a wonderful story. As you can tell, we're married. Some of you, this is our first <laughs> time being with us. And it's an amazing thing to change the world together. Sometimes you have no idea what you're doing and how it will affect the world, you know? Right. We never know the impact of what we are doing, but what we do in life will echo in eternity. Right. I remember 1984, I was at LSU campus, uh -oh. and I met this young sorority girl, <laughs> kind of clueless, and full of zeal and enthusiasm. Little did I know that Barry Luss would become a disciple <laughs> and change the world. <laughs> you don't know who you meet today and what they're going to do. That's right. You have no idea. When I was at some of my darkest, deepest moments, what would encourage me most was thinking about people like Barry. And I thought, if I didn't do anything else right, helping her become a disciple changed the world. And so I think we have no idea, only in eternity will you get a taste of the impact you've had on this world. You know, how do we change the world? 
one person at a time. Somehow, some way, someone, we can help every day. All of us can do that. I'm not sure where you live and where you work and your neighborhood and your friends, but somehow, some way, you can reach out to someone every day. Right. And if we all do that, there's about 3,000 of us here tonight. And if we all did that over the next year, we'd reach 1.2 million people. If we just start now, just start with that one person, just reach out to them and reach out to someone else and continue doing that and make it part of our lives every single day, we'll change the world one person at a time. We thank God for you. We thank God for the church. We thank God for all that God's done in our lives, for the grace of God, for saving us, that we can live deliberately, act decisively, and stay determined. We thank God for you, for all the singles around the world. Remember the tip of the spear, leading churches around the world in missions and church planning and helping the poor. Brothers and sisters, we can change the world one person at a time. Thank you very much. We love you.